Why are Western people wrong about how the global poor use the internet? This is the University of the Netherlands. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about the next billion users. This entirely new demographic that's really fast coming online, right? And transforming the internet in ways we cannot even imagine. And yet the strange thing is they are hardly researched. And people are not really looking at what they do, what do they want, what are their aspirations. And so that really got me kicking into this research, right? So I'm a digital anthropologist. And basically that's a fancy way of saying is that I basically look at what people do with their digital media, you know, how do they feel about it, and how do they integrate it into their everyday lives. I've spent about a decade looking at these low-income populations, um, you know, in the slums of India, uh, favelas of Brazil, to townships of South Africa. And basically, one of my fundamental questions driving me is that, okay, these low-income populations come from such extraordinary different conditions and contexts, so can we assume that their behaviors are also extraordinarily different from, say, you and I? And so that really got me immersed into this, right? Now, when I started this research, well, it was a very fringe research. People were like, come on, nobody's going to care about this, right? But uh, later on, today, in just about a year or so, this has become very, very hot. Tech companies are setting up labs, like Next Billion User Labs. Wall Street is setting up like investment firms called, investment groups called Next Billion User Groups. And why is that so? Because we are in a data economy. And by next year, majority of the data is going to be emanating from the global south. So that's something which has become very important. And now these low-income users, the global south, have become market-worthy. Right? And now I'm hip, I guess. So, now let's go into who these people are then. What do they want? So, for starters, about 34, 35% of them are young, right? And 85% of them live outside the West. So, as you can see, they are sort of spread out. As the young people, in terms of percentages, decline in the West, they're exponentially rising in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And that has implications. A couple of things. We know that the young demographic uses digital media far more, you know, than the average other demographic. Now, in China, the average user uses it twice as much as the average American user. So now that's like compounded by it. Not only do we have by sheer number the people outside the West producing data, but they're producing data at twice or thrice the amount, right, per the average user. So that's a lot of data. So besides this, there's another kind of uh, interesting fact about this demographic is that there's a gender divide, right? And that is a rather dark aspect of it, because what we see is that in certain areas, especially like sub-Saharan Africa, the divide in digital access and usage can be as astounding as 40%. And why is that so? Well, a couple of reasons. So partly it's because of the pay gap between men and women. It can go up as high as 20%. So that means women have far less disposable income to buy a luxury product like a data plan, right? So it's often like uh, prepaid and in very micro amounts. Partly it's to do with cultural norms, because women are supposed to use digital media for very practical reasons, like call up home or notify your parents when they're coming, you know, and that kind of stuff. Whereas boys are allowed to use it for far more things like gaming and entertainment, so they can relax and spend much more time on digital media. But there's another factor, and that is exercise by choice. Women are choosing to not be on digital media. And that's partly because of the growing hate speech, misogyny, revenge porn, that can actually cost them their lives, right? So there's extraordinary risk in even showing your face to the Middle East, right? Like, what kind of profile photo can you have? What, what are you going to curate, right? So this whole idea of the attention economy can be turned around. So when we think in those terms, it's a rather dark, you know, aspect. But moving on, right? 
what is astounding about this is that in spite of this wealth of and diversity of populations, what is astounding to me is that there's one theory or one kind of lens that has been used to sort of analyze this demographic for decades, which is the Maslow theory, right? This theory came up in the 40s, seriously, the 40s. And they currently, if you look at current policy and tech business models, it is resting. You just have to scrap the surface and you will see this Maslow logic is deeply embedded in it. What does this theory basically say is, if you are a poor person, then surely the way you need to behave or the way you would behave, obviously, is that you will first satisfy your physiological needs, then your safety needs, and only in the end will you look at self-actualization. That is completely untrue. I'm not saying it. In fact, there's vast amounts of studies from the 40s debunking this theory. And yet, in the West, there is such a deep, hardcore love for this theory that it continues to be persistent in stereotyping these populations in the most strangulating ways because they obviously cannot put self-actualization at the heart of the matter because that humanizes them, right? And so what I'm really inviting you to do is turn the pyramid around and put self-actualization because that's the key way and the key motivation driving these users. So I'd like to talk about three myths that we, you know, we need to dismantle if we are to really approach this as a global conversation, right? So the first is that the poor are very utility-driven, right? So they're more utility-driven than us. Now, what I'm, the logic behind this uh, sort of proposition is that, you know, well-meaning organizations, uh, people, institutions are like, look, these people come from extraordinarily poor circumstances. You know, their communities have failed, their institutions have failed them. And so what is going to happen is technology is going to swoop in and save them, right? You're going to have this new technology, now the mobile phone with the internet. And through this, they, farmers can check crop prices, uh, women can check healthcare information, children can learn at last through the internet and learn English, and they can really overcome and pull themselves out of poverty. It's a beautiful story. But what do I find and what did we, you know, what does the data tell us? is that after a decade of anthropological experience, and now we even have the data to prove it, right, is that majority of what people like them do online is very much like what you and I would do. In fact, 90% or so of the data is channeled for entertainment, gaming, pornography, socializing, you know, just everyday kind of stuff. But the thing is, the reaction towards that is usually panic, moral panic that, Jesus, what are these guys doing? What a waste of a resource, right? And I, I, I imagine I can understand why that's so, because in fact, they're spending extraordinary amounts of their scarce income for this. But look, if you think about it a little longer, you will realize that it's extraordinarily actually rational. You would probably do the same. Because these populations are in extraordinary circumstances where, say, sometimes it can be extraordinarily mind-numbing, right? You're stuck in traffic for many, many hours. You're working in extraordinarily dehumanizing jobs uh, in factories. You are unemployed. A lot of the youth in, say, Namibia, for example, more than 50 of, uh, 50 percent of them are unemployed. You're bored and your self-worth is getting low and you need to escape. You need a channel where you can find yourself, you can express yourself and remind yourself your, about your humanity. And so this has become a critical coping mechanism for them, right? And this is survival. So the internet is often the only leisure economy and leisure is a survival technique. So a couple of behaviors. One can ask is that, are they online behaviors then kind of like our behaviors? So on one hand, yes, they do what we do, but in a different way. And I'll tell you how. So for example, friends, okay? Now I have a question for you guys. How many here would actually accept a friend request from a total stranger? 
just two, three. All right, not many, huh? So this is actually pretty valid uh, sort of, actually that's pretty much dead on because in the West it is less than 4% or 2% of the population that would do that, right? Now, what if I told you that in the global South, it's often half to two thirds of the demographic that would accept them, right? And why is that so? Because Facebook is the internet. It's rolled into being Tinder and LinkedIn and every possible need and, you know, all rolled into one. Moreover, these guys look at themselves as global citizens because just think about it. You are stuck in a slum and people are like, oh, you have this caste, you have this tribe, this religion, you're screwed, right? You're poor and all this. You're like reduced to the co lowest common denominator. And here they're on Facebook and they look up John and Jess from Ireland and they friend them and then they can show off that they have international friends and they have girlfriends and boyfriends and they serenade them online. There's this whole life that they experience on Facebook that they don't get to live through, right? So it is very natural. So or take, for example, the media industry. There's a lot of celebration that, look at this, Netflix is a major media disruptor. And you know, it is. Netflix really disrupted the media empire, the cable television networks here in the US, undoubtedly so, right? But when it goes to the global south, it's a different kind of conversation. We are not looking at those television networks because what we are doing and what we are threatening is the informal networks. We're talking about informal piracy economies which dominate like say 60 to 80% of the market. So you are appealing to a user group who's used to the product being free. So try competing with that, right? And piracy is the single most you know, big problem for tech companies and will continue to be unless they start thinking differently about value addedness to this population. And porn, my favorite subject. So, um, you know, here's a question for you, another question. How many of you do not watch porn? <laughs> Interesting, okay. Well, I, I like the, you know, honesty here, right? <laughs> so look, there's a lot of panic about porn, but the fact remains that porn has been the single most powerful gateway into the internet for all the populations around the world. If you look at what people, why do they get online? Often it was about sexual curiosity, right? And it is an extraordinarily compelling thing. And we, it's not a sort of theory. We literally know now through datafication how long do people stay on sites, what are their search preferences in terms of porn behavior, which countries are searching for what kinds of things, right? In India, they look up the most popular term is sister-in-law, right? It's interesting, very dark and disturbing. So, but look, the reason is because the more conservative culture is, right? The more restrained women are and men are in talking to, the, uh, talking to each other and arranged marriages are the norm, that you need to understand about sex. You are a young person who's trying to discover what your body's telling you, how to interact with the other sex, and also maybe you're a homosexual. So all this is new for you and nobody is talking to you. The education institutions are not talking to you. Parents are not talking to you. And if anything, it's absolutely condemned. And Hollywood, or Bollywood rather, is showing two birds like reaching, kissing, or the sun setting, or all these kind of euphemisms. And there you go, a baby is produced, right? That's not going to be the best education for you. So anyway, so moving on to the next myth, right? The second myth is about privacy uh, as a key driver for innovation. There's been a lot of talk about why privacy is important, and I'm not saying it's not. Of course, it's a very important value, right? The right to be left alone is essential. However, it's a relative value, because what we shouldn't forget about is that privacy is an extraordinary luxury. And he, just picture something like this. Picture living in a favela like that, right? So we are talking about a billion people in the world today 
live in informal settlements like this, which basically means, on average, you're living in a one-room house with three generations, your grandparents next to you, your mom or your dad or some uncle, and you have zero privacy in that space. You step out of your home and you're in a community that you grew up in, a slum or a favela a township, and everybody knows you. So everybody's watching you and will report to your relatives, right? What kind of privacy? And then you add to that, if you're in Brazil, the pacification police, the mafia, the drug lords, who you have to friend and accept, and trust me, you all would accept their friend request, right? So that is the kind of environment they're in, and so, of course, privacy is a luxury. And the last myth that I would like to talk about is about automation is the future. And again, there's a lot of buzz around this, right? That everything's getting automated uh, from our schools to healthcare, et cetera. But here I would like us to be a little more composed about that narrative, right? So I was hired to look at this sort of research on what is happening in innovation in the global south and what are people doing in terms of what kind of apps are they coming up with for this population, right? And what I found was something interesting is that it seemed like a very diverse set of apps, but they all seemed very astronomical, like they wanted, like there was a school within an app, like this app will basically replace teachers or an app which will replace, you know, doctors. It was all about replacing the human rather than supplementing typical human agencies, right? And we know today that only one out of 10,000 apps actually succeed. The market is insane and vicious. And moreover, communities are extraordinarily ingenious. You just have to go to these communities to realize that in spite of these you know, extremely constraining circumstances, they do get education, they do learn how to you know, take care of themselves. And so imagine supporting that and pushing them forward, right? So just to wrap up here, you know, in the West, when I talk to my students also, there's a lot of... Uh, pessimism bias that we're experiencing. You know, this idea that Facebook is killing democracy, you know, social media is killing our minds, it's making us stupid. We need to protect ourselves, our communities, our families. In fact, if anything, we're always reading about the negative impacts about, you know, uh, social media. But what we need to also keep in mind, if we really want to have a global conversation about this, is that, you know, there's an optimism bias in the rest of the world. We're talking about billions of people who are hyper-optimistic. And so the internet, if it's really to be a global marketplace of ideas and people, we need to sort of reconcile the two and deeply acknowledge both sides, right? Because after all, we want to reform the internet. All of us do, right? We want to make it better. But you can't make something better that you don't love. So you need to remind yourself why you love these digital technologies for us to actually make a change. And that should be our starting point. Thank you for listening.